And we will start the regular meeting of the Larkspur City Council on Wednesday, March 3rd at 6.31. So we're, we're pretty much on, on time. So I wanna welcome everyone who's attending, our council members and members of the public. And we will start with a roll call if we could. Council member Candell. I'm here. Council member Paulson. Here. Council member Way. Here. Vice Mayor Hilmer. Here. Mayor Hara. I am here. And if we could start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Do we have a flag? Not seeing it. Give me one second. It's almost there. Oh, okay. All right. no. That's right. <clears throat> there it is. Uh, now I just have to tell it to stop having my virtual background and we can see the beautiful flag. There you, there go. you go. All right. So for those of us who are participating in the meeting, this is a, a, a longstanding tradition of our Larksburg City Council is to uh, say the pledge. So if we can start doing that, I would appreciate that. So I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag, flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, America, America to the Republic, Republic for, which for which it stands, stands. One, nation, one nation under God, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. For all. Thank you. Uh, we need super titles and a bouncing ball. <laughs> we do. It's 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 hard to do that with us all doing it in synchronicity. It's hard to do it, but you know we'll we'll pull it off. All right. So with that, uh, we will move on. Um, and at this point of the meeting, uh, agenda item number two is public comment for members of the public who wish to uh, provide comments to the council and to the public generally on matters that are not on the council agenda. And we will try to keep things brisk, um, but if there are, uh, if there's anyone who's um, wanting to participate in this part of the, uh, the agenda, um, Allison, can you let us know? Thank you. I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members for public comment. And I'll note that the city council received written public comment earlier this afternoon, which is available on the online agenda packet. And I'm looking for any further public comment from our audience members. And there's no public comment. Okay, all right. Well, um, thank you for that. So we'll move on to agenda item number three, presentations and proclamations. Um, looks like we have a few and uh, we'll get started with the first one, North South Greenway presentation from the Transportation Authority of Marin, uh, Tam, and Cal Trans. So I'm not sure how we're switching over to that, but let's do that. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of the council. This is Bill Whitney. I'm with the Transportation Authority of Marin. And thank you for allowing me to update you on a project that the Transportation Authority of Marin is sponsoring in this Larkspur. Mm -hmm. I last updated you uh, nearly four years ago, so I guess it's about time. Uh, I am joined tonight that's monitoring from Caltrans, four members from the construction team. So if you have any questions, uh, they are available um, for uh, responding to your questions. So let me share my screen. Are you able to see that? Yes, I am, yeah. Very good, thank you. Okay, so again, this is a project that the, the uh, Transportation Authority is sponsoring. Uh, it is a project that is on what is known as the North-South Greenway. The North-South Greenway is a concept of a series of paths, sidewalks, um, bicycle lanes from one end of the county to the other. Uh, it is not sponsored by a single entity. It is really sponsored by all the agencies up and down the corridor. 
So for example, uh, just north of Olimpali Park in Novato, Caltrans and the County of Marin have been sponsoring a bike path uh, from that location up to the county line. Uh, here's a graphic that shows some of the projects that have been implemented over the years uh, in central Marin. So if I could just draw your attention to the top part of the screen, it's actually not shown on this particular graph, but there is a new path, not, 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 not real new, but um, SMART just built it from the Civic Center station um, down to North San Pedro. Um, back in the 2000, 2008, 2006 era, uh, Caltrans and TAM sponsored a path adjacent to the highway from Terra Linda down into central San Rafael, ending at Mission Avenue. Uh, we're working that downtown area right now in central San Rafael, but a path has been completed from 2nd Street down to Anderson Drive. Uh, most of it's a class one path, but there is a section from Rice Drive to uh, 2nd that is actually class four bike path. It's very, very nice. Uh, moving south, there is the Cal Park Tunnel Pathway that was opened in the city of Larkspur in 2010. Just a marvelous addition to the path, provided a nice, uh, uh, easy uh, path of travel between Larkspur and San Rafael. And then uh, back in 2016, we completed the project that was referred to as a north-south, I mean, the Central Marine Ferry Connector, and that connected the Cal Park a tunnel path down to a new bridge across the Sir Francis Drake and then touches down at Sir Francis Drake. Uh, the project we're here to talk about tonight is the purple uh, line that you see and that is a project that is building a path on the Caltrans structure crossing Corte Madera Creek and then eventually coming down touching to Old Redwood Highway and then further extending down to the pedestrian overcrossing uh, and Green Bray crossing over to the other side, the west side of 101. We have begun implementing this project five years ago, really looking at two projects. We called it the Northern segment and then the Southern segment. So we pursued them separately because they were on different paths. We'd already done a lot of work on this purple line, but we had done virtually no work on this blue line. So that was our strategy at the time. Uh, generally, the project goals are to continue to close the gap in the non-motorized network and to encourage bicycle and walking for transportation and recreational use. Here is the path. It's a substandard existing sidewalk that's adjacent to the northbound 101 off-ramp. I believe it's just at four feet wide. Um, it is pretty heavily used um, and it is... Um, being proposed to be replaced with a 12 foot path that will connect the pedestrian overcrossing to the south with the uh, Central Marine Ferry Connector Bridge. Here's a wonderful picture in 2016 of the uh, ribbon cutting ceremony that opened that marvelous structure up to the public. I do apologize, these are some very old graphics, but they do generally show the alignment that we are promoting here, building. Uh, this is the connection at the Central Marine Ferry Connector at Sir Francis Drake. The solid line is on the Caltrans structure continuing south down to where it touches Old Redwood Highway. Then at this point, we really have two options. We are looking at the southern segment, which I'll show next, but then we are going to promote the construction of a new path along Old Redwood Highway um, down to pedestrian overcrossing, as I mentioned. Here's a graphic that uh, depicts the southern segment concept that we uh, were pursuing, and I'll mention that later. But the concept is really to pick it up at Old Redwood Highway and then cross private property, which we do not have, and an easement would need to be obtained, um, that would go to the uh, smart alignment. There's a number of jurisdictions in the southern segment, kind of the yellow area that is shown, that is the city of Larkspur. The, the blue line is actually the county of Marin, uh, also the smart uh, right-of-way. 
And then the pink line is actually controlled by the town of Corte Madera. And the concept really overall is to get people down to this junction, which has existing paths going south and then also going west to the Sander Marker Trail. So the concept is to create a separate, separated um, multi-use path using the bents of the existing structure to create a 12 foot wide path continuing up and over Corte Madera Creek. This is a cross section of what you would see is we are going to be basically constructing this separated path on the bents that will be completely separated from the highway. The existing sidewalk that you see now is gonna be removed and it will create a shoulder for the northbound off ramp. The concept uh, that we pursued was to create a, an accessible path of travel that complies with accessibility uh, guidelines. And the current profile of the bridge structure is uh, eight and a half percent and exceeds what is maximum maximum amount that is allowed. So what we're proposing to do is separate the profile from the roadway itself. So it's gonna be a very unique looking structure where this path is actually higher than the roadway at both ends. And then it's actually lower at the top peak of the structure. So I'd like to draw your attention to the graphics in the upper left hand corner. So the far left uh, graphic shows the pathway where it is above the roadway. So that would be towards the wings, towards the, where it's touching, uh, meeting the, the, uh, the grade, the ground. And then the one next to it to the right is actually going to be the profile of the path at center span. Bill, may I ask a question? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Um, this is the first time I've seen this. Uh, the first time I've seen it too. Illustration and um, has the has who at TAM has seen this, including the board. When we were developing this project over the last five years, we had a subcommittee that we had created that we met probably on a quarterly basis, and then we, um, you know, I showed them the concept as we took this through. Um, the design process. And then we have brought this to the full TAM board a number of times. So we've had um, public outreach efforts over the last five years. So, so I, under I understand that that part of it. I'm, I'm referring specifically, have, have I missed the illustration that's in the further up left corner where there's a piece of it that's above the roadway, the, the uh, bike path? Uh, Commissioner, I, um, I, I'm really not sure if you were at the meetings um, that we were we were hosting. Uh, it was a, a subcommittee okay. made up of Corte Madera, uh, the county, um, large school representatives, uh, MTC representative, um, counselor, uh, the supervisors for the district this lies in, which really is two. Um, so I, I apologize if you haven't seen no, it. No, no. That's okay. I, okay. Follow, follow up question. Um, the areas that are above the, where the bike path is above the roadway, um, do you know the length of those segments, one on either side of the top? I can tell you the width. The length really would be demonstrated in this profile. I'm trying to understand how long a driver now is going to have this new obstruction next to them as they're driving up and down. If I were to guess, I'm sorry, I don't have that exact number. I would say approximately 500 to 750 feet. Total or on each end? Um, well, the majority of the difference, as you see, is on the right side, which is to the north, on the north uh, bank. Yeah. So so, so that would be the, the one that would be probably most visible. And we put a lot of thought into the design of that and the line of sight for the drivers, the, the pedestrians, 
I'm just trying to understand if there are any significant views that are blocked for any significant amount of time that are currently now available to drivers and what those views might be. Um, are, they, are they of of Sir Francis Drake kind of in the uh, Drake on the way to the ferry? Is that what's obstructed? So for the the drivers on on the peak of the crest, they would not have any obstructed scenic views. I understand. Okay, as you're coming down, the drivers would then. Um, that not that there's a scenic view looking forward there. There's the northbound on ramp at this location, um, so I, I can't think of any scenic view that would be blocked. But they would be obs uh, obstructed from viewing traffic westbound on Sir Francis or east westbound on Sir Francis Drake. Is that right? No, the the the, the visual. Um, line of sight for the drivers will they'll be able to continue to see cars that are at or approaching that intersection okay all right uh, are there maybe um when you have time at tam you could figure out a simulation of what the obstructed uh, view shed looks like for me just as a diagram and, and what those views might include. Okay, let, let me- As a point of information, we can follow up later with this. Okay, let me, let, let, let me work on that. I'd, I'd, I'd endorse that suggestion from, from, uh, from, from Dan. I think that's, uh, this is a little confusing and I think it's important for us to be uh, it's, it's, really it's clear really about my, it. It's really for my own understanding and clarification. Yeah, and mine and others. Okay. Um, but I think what's important that, that at the crest, um, we've actually enhanced the, the, the views. Um, for yeah, the I got it. And I'm just trying to understand the impacts. And I apologize yeah. if I hadn't picked up on this before. No, no, no. Yeah, no, that's fine. We, we appreciate it, Bill. Go ahead. Yeah, oh. yeah. Thanks. I appreciate it. So I think, you know, speaking of the scenic views, so one of the things that we've done is added amenities such as these Belvedere's uh, at the bends. That, that allow the pedestrians to stop, enjoy the views of the creek, um, look to the east. Um, they're able to get out of the, the, uh, the path of travel for oncoming bicyclists. So uh, we feel this is a real added value to the project. And then, and then continuing south. So the project that I spoke of earlier is, is being constructed and is within the state right away uh, by Caltrans. So that project is under construction. We look at about a year to be complete. Then right after that, we'd like to follow up with the path between the highway and old highway continuing south down to the pedestrian overcrossing. So the status is, um, I mentioned, we have environmentally uh, cleared, permitted, completed the design that was led by TAM. Uh, then we've asked Caltrans as the owner operator to construct. Uh, they know how to build these kind of things. TAM is not in the business of construction and we really do appreciate their, their leadership on that. Uh, when we do, when we go down to the um, multi-use path on Old Redwood Highway, uh, we've already started the design. We're well under the design. Um, we are partially environmentally cleared through CEQA, but we've added some federal monies to that segment uh, due to some budget shortfalls. And so we need to back up and do some environmental work uh, to comply with the NEPA document. Uh, a little bit about the funding plan. So the majority of the funds um, for this project are from Regional Measure 2, uh, a little over $10 million. Uh, as a result of the, the bids exceeding our available funds, um, we seek some funding from the uh, SB1 Local Partnership Program. Uh, as I previously mentioned, the um, project has federal funds for the old Redwood Highway segments. And then we have received a grant from the Bay Area Air Quality Management District and other funds from TAM. 
So hurrah, we're under construction. Uh, we're just kicking off. Uh, Caltrans is gearing up. There's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. Um, but uh, this is the work that you're seeing out there now, and you will start to see a fair amount more very soon. Uh, a little bit about the schedule. So Caltrans officially uh, gave the notice to proceed to the contractor on February 16th. Um, according to their schedule, they should be uh, open to the public for public use early in 2022. So the way that um, I've worked with your public works department is to get a project uh, ready to go um, through the design process in 2021. And then hopefully uh, we could begin construction in the year 2022. Um, again, working with uh, your public works department and their work program. So I wanna mention that because of the project overruns, we had to shift monies around uh, and we had funds for environmental for the Southern segment that I showed earlier, that's out on the uh, railroad right away. And we've mm -hmm. had move all of the funds that are remaining from that project. We are continuing to seek grants for that, but that project is currently not funded. So although TAM is a sponsor of that project, we are not pursuing it actively now. So with that said, I'd like to open that to any comments, questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. I'm, I'm, uh, this has been a project uh, long in the works, and I'm glad to see that we're making making some progress. Uh, are there any comments or questions from this council? I got two hands up. I saw Dan's first. Dan Hilmer. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, Bill, when I saw some of the diagrams shown previously, I had uh, suggested uh, that it'd be helpful to start showing the, uh, is it a class two path that goes along the uh, west side of Old Redwood Highway from the existing pedestrian overcrossings to Warnham Drive? Did I describe that correctly? Yes, yes. That is not part of the project area. We stopped uh, at I understand. the overcrossing to the north. Yeah, but, I, but as a, just a point of information on the diagrams. I don't know if there's a way to show it as an existing condition, but I think it's helpful for people to see that what's being proposed is a gap closure of sorts, um, especially given the shifting of the funding away from the south, the southern segment, because it shows the existing uh, continuity of paths that we're creating or enhanced continuity uh, with this project uh, that actually get, helps get people not only to the ex pedestrian overcrossing that exists, but to Wernham Drive on the uh, north side there. Um, yes, council member, understood. Um, I would mention that TAM did fund the addition of those class two pri uh, bike paths years ago um, working with your public works department, I believe there is a project that is proposed within your five-year capital improvement program. So our eyes are on that segment. Uh, just to show it as an existing condition, not to suggest it's part of the project. If there's no way to show it as an existing condition, then you know I'll leave that to you. But I think it's helpful for people to see that the, the path doesn't stop at the overcrossing. It continues as an existing path to Warnham. Okay, very, very good. Thanks, thanks, Dan. That's that's uh, helpful. I see Gabe also has his hand up. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, yeah, thanks, Bill, for the presentation. I, I'm pretty new to this, so I just had some very basic questions. What's the current, um, you know, traffic, you know, daily or weekly in that overpass, you know, that gap that you're trying to close? Um, and, and the other question would be safety. So I believe that what's being replaced is about four feet wide. And I think there's signage there that says walk your bike and nobody walks their bike, they ride it. And, you know, and I'm curious, you know, with pedestrians and bikers and that much width, you know, what sort of um, safety engineering 
has been put in place to avoid collisions and to control speeds and so forth? Thank you. I, I can tell you that we did some bicycle pedestrian counts, I don't know, a year ago or so. And I believe the usages were as around 750 users a day um, in its existing condition. So with those improved safer separated facilities, I would, I would expect that the usage would in increase. And anecdotally, I, th I think that's ab absolutely true. I've, I've used that now. It's, it's, it's dangerous until it's improved. So uh, I think once it's improved, we'll see a lot more uses, usage. Yeah, and sorry, Bill, on, on the safety part, I, I, maybe that's not part of this presentation, but you know, it looks like planning has already you know, looked at, at widths and certain pullouts and so forth. You know, are there you know, any, you know, any kind of ways to separate pedestrians from bikers or what's the sign at your house? So I would say that I was involved with the, the design and development of the Cal Park Tunnel Pathway. Um, we, we worked through that process thoroughly at that location. And uh, we had the same width as we have here, which is 12 feet, which is the minimum for a class one facility. Um, we, we chose to basically use a, a separation, a center line type of separation. Um, we, we avoid um, designating, you know, who should use what and where as far as pedestrians and bicyclists, unless the conditions warrant it. And, 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 uh, and in these other facilities, I, I, I don't believe that has uh, been warranted. All right, thank you. And the, and the Cal Park Tunnel is great. I've used it many times, both um, as a pedestrian and as a bicyclist, and uh, it works well. So uh, keep that up. Any other comments from uh, yes. council members? My hand's up over here. Okay. All right. Catherine? Uh, thank you, Bill, for that. Um, I just have, have a question about your timeline. Um, it looks like you have about a 16 to 18 month timeline. And while we are doing the Bonaire Bridge right now, our timeline is much longer because of environmental concerns of working across and in the water. Are you facing any of those uh, concerns with um, the species that live within the creek? Um, very much so. The compliance with environmental regulations has been a very big part and time consuming part in the development of this project. We have a couple of endangered species at that location as you do at Bonaire Bridge. Um, so there are certain environmental windows that we have to work within and the uh, contractor and, and the con contract administration team with uh, Caltrans are uh, very aware of those windows. And we are feverishly trying to get some work done behind the scenes to allow the work that occurs in the field to occur within those environmental windows. Okay. I just think it's important that the public realizes that we do have to uh, work within limitations based on agencies and environmental restrictions that are important, but they can also cause um, <clears throat> times uh, delays within projects. So I hope we don't have that. But, uh, that's my only question on this. I've seen this presentation before. Thank you. Bill, Thank you. This, is, this is Kevin, just out of curiosity, what, what, are, what are the specific species that you're, you're concerned about in that area? Uh, the it's a, a bird the Ridgeway rail. Okay, that's and yeah we deal with that. And then the uh, the mouse the salt marsh salt marsh harvest mouse. Right. The two primary species that we are dealing with. There's also birds that we are we are um, required to you know be aware of the Migratory Bird Act and, and some windows associated with those those animals. Okay. Good. All right. Great. Well, that that's important to us in, in our city. That's something that we paid a lot of attention to in the Bonaire Bridge project. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other comments or questions from the council? Um, this is a, just a presentation, but I think I could open it up to see if there are any public comments. Thank you. Our first public comment will come from Aaron Wilkinson. Go ahead, Aaron. And Aaron, you may unmute yourself on your end.
Sorry, Allison, I was muted. Um, no public comment on that. Um, I was just waiting for the consent calendar. Oh, okay. First time at the show. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, welcome to the party. We appreciate it. Uh, any, any, anyone else, Allison? Thank you. Our next public comment will come from Kevin Carroll. Good evening, and thanks for the presentation. Yeah, a couple of questions, uh, and I assume there's no back and forth, so I'll just ask the three questions I'm particularly interested in. One is uh, where the construction guys are currently set up. They took over a storage yard um, and cleaned it out, which is fine. I understand that, but uh, some of the people that were using it are now kind of overcrowding what was limited parking in the area before. So my question is, at the end of construction, will that go back to being a storage yard? And presumably they'll move back in there. The other thing I'm curious, I'm a, I use this path frequently, and from the drawings, it looks like going, say, from uh, the RV park to the smart station, we'll go over this ramp, go back down to ground level at the intersection of Sir Francis Drake, and then back up again on the spiral or the L back and forth shape uh, overcrossing bridge. And I'm wondering if any allowance is being made for sea level rise on that segment between the freeway and the current smart structure, because it does flood out at King Tides right now. It, uh, that intersection does flood and the pathway is partially blocked too. And that's already under current conditions. So I'm wondering if that segment's gonna be raised up or an allowance is gonna be made that that can happen at some point down in the future. And then my third question is really about the Southern segment. Um, it looks like there's about seven government agencies involved, City of Corte Madera, City of Larkspur, SMART, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, County of Marin, Transportation Authority of Marin and Caltrans, and then Audubon Society will be in there even though they're a nonprofit. And so I'm wondering, my understanding was the lead agency was gonna be the County of Marin Public Works. So where should we be looking to be kept up to date on the, when that project is gonna proceed in the future? Okay, that, that was a lot. Bill, can you respond to some of that? Uh, certainly, maybe a couple of many ways. Um, the area that is being used as a staging area um, along Old Redwood Highway uh, is a property that is owned and controlled by the state. Uh, that property is leased to the, um, the Greenbrae Boardwalk there for parking. So we are aware of the impact to the folks on, on the, the, uh, the boardwalk. Um, we've kept them informed all along as we've been designing this. Um, but the, uh, the Caltrans uh, team needs that area as a staging area. When they are done with the construction though, uh, we are going to make some enhancements to that area, which will certainly improve the use uh, for the boardwalk folks. Um, on the question of the Southern segment, um, TAM is the sponsor and we will remain the sponsor. It is an important project to my board uh, they have directed uh, staff to continue to seek grants to allow that project to move forward. We have done so, but so far it's been unsuccessful. So uh, we really are the agency that you'll want to monitor um, in the progress of, of that Southern segment. Okay, Any, anything else in response to those questions? Anyone else from the public? I'm looking for any further raised hands. Um, it looks like we have a comment from the same commenter before. Would you like to reopen that um, same sure. comment? Yeah, no, please. That's fine. Okay, Kevin Carroll, uh, you may unmute yourself again. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, the other question was the flooding on that segment between what you're starting now and the current uh, overpass over Sir Francis Drake. Right. 
we are matching the existing grades of Sir Francis Drake. Changing the elevation grades of, of Sir Francis Drake is really out of the scope of this project. Um, we certainly uh, acknowledge the high tides in that area. We did some um, work when BCDC was permitting the Central Marin Ferry Connector to allow for an adaptation over time. Um, but uh, we have no specific concepts at this time. Okay, Kevin, any, any follow up on that? I apologize, he's muted again. Oh, <laughs> I can okay. uh... All right, well, uh, uh, let's see if there's anyone else from the public or and otherwise we'll move on. I'm looking for any further raised hands from our audience members or any emailed public comments. And there is no further public comment. Okay, great. Um, so I'll bring it back to the council for any uh, additional follow-up, um, if there is any. I just wanted to make a comment to thank Bill um, and also acknowledge that we lost a community member, Cindy Winter, uh, last month, who was very involved in, in bicycle and pedestrian things. Uh, her um, friend gave me a box of uh, Cindy's uh, notes of public comments and, and designs and all sorts of things. And um, I'll share them with public works. Um, but there's a large file that she created about the North South Greenway, which um, I think she would have been pleased to see that it's moving forward. So yes, absolutely. Thank and thank and thank you for mentioning um, Cindy. And we, I think we all have an interest in um, doing something meaningful to acknowledge her contributions to our community. And we'll have some conversations about that over the coming uh, sessions. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Mr. Helmer. Uh, just as a, a kind of a putting a, a marker on what you just said, uh, when this construct, when the segment uh, of bikeway is, is finished in the future, we might want to consider uh, some kind of memorial plaque or something for because Cindy did work hard on on uh, yes making sure that this segment uh, found its way through the process. So maybe we could uh, have a conversation about this at our council in the future. Yes, I I, I very much want want to do that because it's uh, Cindy was a um, a vibrant uh, force in our council meetings over a long long time, and she's missed. So we need to acknowledge her contribution. And thank you, Bill, for a very thorough presentation. And thank you, Catherine, for uh, reminding us of uh, Cindy's contribution. Yeah. OK, any more on this particular item? Uh, if not, I just want to thank Bill very much for a very uh, uh, well presented um, um, presentation. And uh, pr uh, pre appreciate appreciate it very much. Um, this is a project that's been long coming. I know there's a hurdle still to uh, overcome, but uh, uh, it will make uh, those of us who use this transportation pathway uh, happier when it's done. So thank you. And with that, we will conclude um, that part of the agenda, which is 3.1, and we will move on to 3.2, which is an update presentation on new concept drawings for the Larkspur Library at Tam, uh, Tam Collins. At the, at, I'm sorry, at the, col <laughs> at, at the columns. I'm mixing up my, <laughs> mixing up my, my notations here. So, uh, uh, and Joe Jennings from far away is I think here to help us out with that. Uh, hello, uh, Mayor Haroff and uh, co council members. I, uh, I'm Joe Jennings. I'm the president of the Commons Foundation and this is an informational uh, update briefing on the changes we made to the concept drawings with the city's input. Uh, and these are the drawings we're using for fundraising and public uh, engagement. Um, and we have been uh, very careful to make sure that the city's been kept abreast of this as we've gone along. So today is more or less an update for you all uh, to see the incorporation of city feedback. Um, so that having been said, um, the city requested that the drawings show that the first uh, phase one of the construction would be a, a 5,000 square foot building on the corner of Rose Lane and Doherty. 
and this is the image looking uh, east, leaving the lucky parking lot, looking at the entrance to the building. Uh, you'll notice that it's a California uh, modern mission style building. It has, uh, if you can see my cursor, it has a portico and uh, to protect people when entering the building during what inclement weather or hot days. Um, across the street is Paul Middle School, about five minute walk up the street is Redwood High and the other schools and the Rose Lane community is wrapped around it. Um, this, this is the aerial view, uh, which allows you to see um, the city wanted to be sure that the entrance to the parking was at the elbow on Rose, um, where the Lucky parking lot has an opening. So we have the entrance to the facility here. There's a drive around close uh, access for dropping off people and picking up uh, folks. Uh, this Ramada is here to provide a shaded area and for people to sit during uh, the summer and spring and fall. There's an enclosed area for outdoor programming for children. And uh, this has a 15 car parking space uh, as per the city's request. And um, along the Southern edge of the, of the first phase is a um, screening hedge so that this parking area is less visible to the community in Rose Lane. Um, the, the next uh, new image is this interior. Uh, we've borrowed architectural elements from the existing library. We have uh, incorporated uh, requests for open air so that the doorways and windows can be opened up. Uh, the floor space is configurable so that, for example, these book cases would, would be on casters and you could roll them out of the way when you wanna have a larger program. Um, this is the view from the crosswalk uh, and the lucky store looking into the parking and how the library and this uh, uh, Ramada sit on the property. It creates a, a gathering area, which we think is attractive to people, whether they're in the building or using the area to read or visit friends, there are spaces for people to sit. And then this drawing shows phase two as we add 5,000 square feet more to the building, relay out the parking at, at a clock tower. And this area that's enclosed by this uh, arbor is the beginnings of a town or our public square. And then the third building, um, phase three, um, which is the larger auditorium space from the original plan. And so this is the completed vision of the commons when you've completed all three phases of construction. We are out. Um, I want, and I do wanna thank uh, Scott Lockhart of Lockhart Designs in Kenfield who created these drawings Chris and Matt Hartzell, Chris who's on our board and um, Matt are both urban planners. They've worked extensively on this to help us figure out the stages and how it would sit on the land and be accessible by foot, by bicycle, by car, by public transportation, and also how to create sight lines that are compelling. Um, and uh, I wanna thank the city's input which gave us a place to start and actually um, it's a very good input. So uh, Mayor Haroff, um, I'm afraid I'm having, may, forcing you to drink coffee. This is terrible. Um, <laughs> I gotta stay awake somehow. I know, I knew that I'd have <laughs> this effect on you. Um, so um, any comments or uh, questions? So let me open it up to the uh, the council. Um, but but before I do that, I want to thank you, Joe, for your continued engagement in this process. It's been very constructive, and um, I think we're making good good progress. So uh, other comments from the council here? I see uh, Council Member Ken Dell. Scott, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Joe. Uh, fantastic. The drawings look beautiful. Um, uh, you did a great job. 
Um, my question is a little off topic. I want to know how the fundraising is going. It's actually going very well, uh, Councilman. We've uh, retained professional uh, uh, help in that area. And we are um, actually, we've already started outreach and we're having, it's called the quiet phase. So we're meeting with potential uh, significant donors. Um, we anticipate um, being in the quiet phase for the next 12 months. And uh, to my surprise, uh, we haven't had anyone who, um, you know, didn't like these drawings. Um, I was sort of worried that, you know, um, whenever you put something forth, you'll have something that people don't want. But instead, I do want to give Dan uh, Schwartz credit. Putting the first phase of the building in this corner and having this parking arrangement was from the city. And it does solve a bunch of problems that a phased approach solves over time, but this first phase created and um, it's been good. It, the major donors we're talking to have all been very positive. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for that question, it's good. Um, Gabe, I see your hand up. Great, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Great to see you. Um, not at Rulies, but uh, <laughs> um, just some very, very basic questions. Uh, first one is phase one, phase two, and phase three square footage. I was assuming five, 10, and 20. You know, maybe you can clarify that. And then the second question is, you know, a lot of the renderings and presentation is on the exterior. I'm, I'm a little bit curious about the interior, if that's not premature, you know, what the, the sense, you know, what the use of the 5,000 is, and, you know, maybe specifically books, you know, we all know things are going digital, and we've learned a lot of lessons, you know, what, what's a, a general, uh, you know, you know, kind of um, plan for how the, the first phase interior would be used. Thank you. Um, you. You did have a slide in there about that. Yeah. So um, back to that. Um, I want to be careful. Um, what we're showing people are images that reflect principles. This one, the key in this is that the main floor is configurable throughout the day because the needs change. Um, we want to make sure that people understand that there's a private conference room that will be part of the design, but we've, we've kept it fairly sparse, Councilman Paulson, because um, when we get into the design build process with the city, um, we'll learn a lot more about what we can get for our money. And we don't wanna set expectations until we have a better understanding of that. So the core principles are um, fl flexible space. Um, hopefully we're able to do it in a way that integrates technology so people can have can be there or they can be like we are through Zoom. Um, we are expecting that the volume of books will still, a lot of it will go through people ordering the books and coming in for pickup, but it's up to really the librarian in the city to determine how much books they have in stacks and things like that. Great, right, thank you. And the square footage, I, I'm not sure I missed something. It's 5,000 for the first phase. We're adding another 5,000 in the second phase. And the third phase was a 10,000 square foot building. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, any other comments from the council? Are you, Kevin, are you Kat able Catherine? to see the little raised hand things? Because I'm not seeing the raised hands. Oh, okay. so, so, so so physically raise your hand. Okay. I don't know how that's working. Okay. I need to upgrade my Zoom account uh, and I have to talk to my daughter about that. Go All ahead. Right. Who do you wanna go, myself or? or yes, myself? no, Catherine, okay. go ahead. All right. Um, hi, Joe, nice to see you. Hi, Catherine. Uh, thank you for this presentation. I think it's important that the, our community knows that this has been a joint project or a joint discussion uh, that's been going on for years now um, under Ann Morrison 
and uh, Kevin Haroff before and met, meeting with the Commons um, Foundation once a month, uh, almost once a month now for several years to, and the city, um, our city manager is there. And the current team that's working on it is our city manager and uh, the, the mayor and myself with the Commons um, Foundation group. So I think uh, this collaborative approach we've had um, has been very, I want people to know that we're having a very collaborative approach uh, at this time. Uh, the second thing is I think to answer sort of Gabe, uh, Gabe's comment, there's been a lot of work done in the last many years since we've been engaged in this project about the form and function of how our residents and our community use these spaces. Um, and I'm confident that we will be able to um, continue that process to make sure that we're maximizing the, the programmatic availability and the function of these spaces. And I think with Franklin's help, he's been um, our community services director. He's been involved in previous um, transformations and buildings of, of community libraries. And uh, I'm confident in his ability to help guide this process too. So um, we've done a lot. We have a lot of data about how our community engages um, our public functions there. So it's going to be a really helpful use of that. Uh, I didn't have anything. I'm looking forward to seeing how this keeps rolling out. Oh, well, my, th Catherine. Th 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 thanks, Catherine. And thank, thank you for calling out uh, Franklin because Franklin is, um, I think he's been very uh, important in uh, allowing this conversation to go forward and very grateful to have him as part of our, our, our community team. Uh, Kevin, if I could say, I, I yeah. would say the combination of both Janice Akel two, three years ago, and then yes. Franklin. Yeah. I also want to call out the friends of the library have been a huge help uh, on this because they're really close to the library. So Barbara Friday and her group yes. have been right. a huge help as well. And frankly, the library board of trustees has been a huge help. So we're getting a lot of good support and input from both the council, the city government, and these other groups. And we're very appreciative of it. Um, I cannot share that sentiment more enthusiastically. I think it's all, all important. And we, we appreciate the engagement of everyone in this process because we're actually moving forward. And that's, exactly. that's rewarding to me to yeah. see. Anything else from the council? Mr. Helmer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, good job. Uh, my question is, um, what has the uh, Rose Lane neighborhood, um, what sort of uh, information have they been shown and, and what sort of feedback have, if any, has been received from them, especially the the property owners most uh, close uh, and adjoining to the site. And so, we, you know, we're, we're going to need everybody behind us. So I want, right. you know, that's the context of my question. Right. So we have met with um, the two different groups, the condo owners versus the houses in the past. Mm -hmm. I anticipate that we'll be seeing them again soon. We also have met with individuals as prospective donors in the community. And we've also had, I, I, I remember a meeting at the police officers station that was sort of an open meeting um, probably 12 months ago. Have, they, um, have, have all those that you just mentioned been shown these drawings? No, no, this, we usually show it to the council first and the city, and then we go out from there. I, I think it's important um, to have the neighborhood discussion uh, about the new concepts described and, and updated concepts described um, as soon as you can. I, uh, I want to know where the neighborhood is on, especially the uh, phasing. I think that's really important to learn. 
just as you're in your information gathering because you've you've you you've shown a, a master plan concept here that i think needs to be vetted with the neighborhood that uh, you're, you, you've cro crossed a line where you really need community input, I think, with respect to the, uh, especially the, uh, the residents that live closest to the site on, on the second phase, primarily. Right, but um, just for a point of information, we're doing the fundraising of the first phase. That's the uh, Commons Foundation's mission. I understand, but my if only to learn later the neighbors oppose the second phase would be an unfortunate set of circumstances. You know, I, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Joe, I think that's something that we can work together on um, in, in, uh, in that outreach. So, um, but we have to have a concept and what you brought forward tonight is a concept. Yeah, I think it's great. I just think you, you're showing something now that you really need to learn where people are because you want to go through both phases with everybody, you know. In yeah, you bet. Absolutely, absolutely. And and we will we can support that happening. Okay, I look forward to it. Anything else from the council? Good job. I say again. Yeah, uh, you're here. Appreciate that. Um, so I, I guess we can ask for the public now to provide any uh, comments or reactions. Thank you. Our first public comment will come from Alan Colinette. Alan, you may unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say what a fabulous project this is and um, how it'll give our town, Larkspur, a central focal point, um, like a town square. And all the most successful communities around the world, as you know, um, have that. So I think it's a wonderful project. Uh, I do have two questions. One is, what is the total cost of all three phases? And number two, has any money been raised uh, at all for phase one? That's not a loaded question. I'm just curious to know specifically how many dollars have already been raised. We've raised in excess of $1 million in pledges in cash uh, against a $5 million target. And the estimated cost of the 20,000 square foot facility is based on a $1,000 per square foot estimated cost. And that would put you at 20 million. Thank you very much. That's uh, all I wanted to know. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. And our Anyone? next public comment. Go ahead. I apologize. Our, our next public comment okay. will come from Barbara Friday. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say how delighted I am to see these pictures and I, how much I appreciate Joe and the Commons Foundation taking on this very, very challenging project. Um, but I also wanted to share that you know, the friends met, met this morning and it becomes very, very, very clear to us that we need a new library. You know, uh, there are our existing library is getting in the way of, of um, you know, being a real library to our community. By that, I mean, I think we're bigger than just uh, curbside and um, a digital services. And although those are both very, very important, this meeting space and um, being open to the public in a safe and um, a, a welcoming way, just the, the importance of that can't be minimized in our community. And I think we just, you know, the, um, the quicker we can do that, uh, the better. Um, from a fundraising perspective, uh, the Friends of the Library continue to really enjoy the goodwill of the citizens of Larkspur and surrounding communities People continue to be generous, but um, you know, um, I really think that the speed that we get this library, our new library built and on the ground is really going to um, hinge on, um, you know, how quickly, uh, you know, uh, how quickly we can deliver for members of our community. So thank you, Joe, the pictures are amazing. Um, I can't wait to, to get in there. You know, can we get this built in like three weeks? 
or you know that's how that's how quickly I think or, or three months you know that's how quickly I think our community needs this thank you all for listening and thank you very much to the council for your support uh, over the years and thank thank you for those those comments and I wish we could do anything in three weeks but I don't know that we can do that but we'll try uh, anyone else Allison I'm looking for any further raised hands or emailed comments. And there's no further public comment. Okay, uh, in that case, I'll bring it back to the council for any uh, concluding comments or, or reactions before we move on. Good job, Joe. Thank you um, very much, Catherine. Good, through the good. mayor, just to clarify, I, I mentioned earlier, I was wanting to learn how the, uh, the neighborhood felt about phase two. I, I yeah, yeah. Phase, phase two and phase three. And I and I and I think that that's a that's a very important um, suggestion, and I think it's something that we need to proceed with. That that's why it's not going to it's going to take more than three weeks. Um, uh, but I think we're happy to work with Joe and his colleagues to um, uh, have those communications. I certainly am willing to participate in that. Yeah, thank you very much, Joe. Okay, and I think with that, uh, unless there's anything else on this item, we'll go on to item 3.3, .3, strategic communications and community engagement update. And I think that may require a uh, staff report. Well, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the city council. I am going to go ahead. My name is Shannon O'Hare. I'm the assistant to the city manager I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. If you'll bear with me for a moment. Everybody see okay. my screen? Yes, Our I am now. Right. Brief yep. update tonight. I realize that I am three of three for presentations. So please feel free to ask any questions during the presentation if you have any as we uh, move through these slides. It's going to be about a 10 minute presentation. Good deal. Thanks. Um, let me. So to provide um, the council and the community with an update of where we are, um, the city adopted a strategic communications and community engagement plan in 2019. As part of that plan, um, one of the things we benchmarked for ourselves was to update the council and the community a couple of times a year at least at where our major communications initiatives and processes were. So as part of this plan, not only were we using the plan internally and increasing our communications, but we wanted to make sure that we kept the community abreast of what we were up to. Um, the last time I presented this, mid last year, late last year, um, we had launched a number of new communications in 2020. This included launching an Instagram account and enhancing our social media. We improved the graphic design, navigation, and visual elements in our reports, forms, and our collateral. Um, we, we did a hard shift, uh, partially out of necessity, and also partially some of this was into the, in the works to more teleconferences, virtual meetings, um, and we also added a number of digital updates to the community for council highlights and e-newsletters with regularity. Um, I'll go through what we've done this past year and then at the end talk about our 2021 goals, which is to continue to enhance communications, always enhancing communications and engaging with the community, especially as we move to um, not, certainly not post COVID, I don't wanna give that impression, but as some of the COVID-19 public health orders and guidelines are modified or lifted, it's looking increasingly like in 2021, we'll move towards increased vaccinations, opening up with modifications and lifting some of the, the more severe requirements um, that were good requirements that necessitated us to do a whole lot remotely. Um, and then finally, we will be promoting, I anticipate a number of new software and digital upgrades um, that the city has been undertaking that we are anticipating to launch in 2021 and early uh, 2022. So on the website digital side, our social media presence and our social media output has continued to grow. Uh, with the website, the department web pages have been simplified and consolidated. If you go to our website just for agendas or just to quickly look at the news, you might not notice a difference. But um, a number of our departments, our community services department, and particularly our planning and building and our public works departments has really simplified and consolidated a lot of their information as people moved to use our website more and to try to find information um, rather than going in person or picking up the phone to make things uh, simpler for folks to find. Um, top pages and reasons people come to our website continue to be for 
library, council agendas, bids, job postings, and planning and building services. Um, and most website traffic continues to be local and visits to our website uh, continue to be fairly short. Um, views of public meetings as we move to the teleconference model shot up in uh, 2020, at the beginning of 2020 considerably, and then have tapered off a little bit. Um, the, uh, the exception to that were a few of our meetings where we had a lot of community and regional interests, the renaming discussions around Sir Francis Drake, some of the um, meetings we have where we gave significant COVID updates, saw quite a spike of folks who attended um, remotely. But other than that, our meeting, uh, views of our meetings have um, stabilized or tapered. Um, our social media and digital communications audience continues to grow. If you look at these numbers, you'll notice that particularly the library account, the library Facebook went down a little bit. That's actually, I think, a sign of success as the library audience moves over to the Instagram account, um, as certain uh, audiences and certain folks move to using Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, um, more to find information than um, using Facebook. But overall, huge increases in all of our social media platforms. And although people don't subscribe specifically to the city, you'll notice a dr pretty drastic uptake in just folks using the Nextdoor platform. Um, I don't have any secret information on this or numbers, but I would guess some of that was also driven by um, the COVID restrictions and people find, wanting to find a community online and communicate with their neighbors um, digitally when they couldn't in person. So we now have a very, very large audience and a very powerful way to reach our community through the next That's good. These are the two digital newsletters we've been sending. We have not sent out a lot of um, old school paper collateral. I'm hoping for that to, for us to move back to that in 2021 and 2022. Um, things were changing so quickly and so dynamically this year that we'd get started on sending out some communications and things would change enough that there was a concern that we might send out outdated information to folks. Um, if you're like me and you leave some of your mail sitting on the counter for a week. Um, so instead we, we focused on digital uh, on the left, you see the city council highlights. So this is where a few days after the meeting, kind of a digest of everything we've accomplished and discussed at our city council meetings is sent out to subscribers. It's been a huge success and we've got a lot of appreciation from the community. And then on the right, you'll see a city manager update, which is sent on alternative weeks, which has all kinds of information from initiatives at the city, as well as things that might be happening with our partner agencies or events that are happening. Um, in Larkspur. I just wanted to show Instagram continues to perform really well. People's favorite content is historic Larkspur and pictures of Larkspur being pretty. It's two great things about our community. <laughs> uh, we, we'll, we'll put it, it's, it's, you know, the, the council meetings, people are a little less likely to click on that than a pretty picture of Larkspur, I'm sorry to report. Why, why would that be? I, know. I, don't, I don't understand. Uh, so, this has really been where a lot of our audience growth has been. You'll see on the right, I don't want to get too much into the, um, the different statistics here. This is a brief presentation, but this is actually where we've gotten people to really follow our account and start to engage with us as people share pictures of Larkspur with mutuals on Instagram who live in Larkspur, live in the community. And it's been a really great way to grow our audience and have folks start following us for other city business and um, local initiatives. Um, and to that point, um, as we post things, that was super powerful way um, as more information came out about COVID-19 measures and then about COVID-19 vaccine sites and as things were changing, people were really appreciative that it was just another way to get information out. Again, the county's done a great job, it's in the news, et cetera, but as it's a really dynamic situation, there's really not enough ways you can tell people about these things as they change um, up to date. And then finally, it was also really nice that the community took an interest as we folks might notice we had holiday banners around on North Magnolia and in downtown. Um, we also did a, a modest holiday shopping guide with our downtown and North Magnolia merchants listing to their websites or their contact information. Um, folks really appreciated that and shared it as well around the holidays, which was nice. In terms of communications coming up, uh, the banners were such a big hit. They started with a uh, uh, micro grant that we got from the from TAM from the Transportation Authority of Marin around some COVID protocols and outdoor dining and shop local 
We then of our own accord did some holiday promotions for uh, the downtown in North Magnolia. And then as we move into the spring, we'll be doing, um, this is the, the draft. Um, they aren't up yet, they're still being ordered, but these will be banners that we'll be placing both in downtown and North Magnolia, um, just promoting shopping, dining and enjoying our downtown and our North Magnolia business district. And so, yeah. Yes, Ms. Was there a question? No, 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 I just said great, thanks. Oh, okay. keep, go keep going. All right, and then final slide, I promise. Um, our 2021 communication goals and works in progress We'll continue to move towards centralized city communications. We'll continue to improve usability and accessibility in communications. I can't take any credit for, uh, if you see maybe at the bottom of the screen, there's closed captioning tonight. That's all the work of our city clerk. We are at the very beginning of our website redesign. So there'll be a lot of usability and accessibility improvements in our website. Our website is accessible now and particularly ADA accessible, but just in terms of user interface and friendliness. Uh, the next iteration will be much improved. Always looking to expand our digital presence, services, and capabilities. Not only I focused on social media this evening, but you've heard it probably in a number of city manager updates for members of the community that have listened to um, other updates and COVID-19 updates. We're moving to have more of our historical documents accessible to the public online. We've purchased new land management software that'll expand our digital capabilities. Um, we're moving to a new phone system. So there are a number of things that aren't necessarily communications, but will require us to communicate with folks who do business with us and our community at large on how to, um, how to work these new tools and how the city will change doing business. Um, at the last presentation I gave, there were a couple of questions that were really good questions about all of these things are great. How are we measuring them and how are we measuring success? This last year, we really focused on audience expansion, kind of professionalizing the look kind of feel of our communications. And I'm confident that we'll continue to expand our audience and that we have a really good rhythm there to reach out to folks and we'll move to more measurement of the engagement, what kind of outcomes for some of the communications we do that are more um, geared towards that. I've mentioned the city website redesign. We're also updating some of our city templates and giving them a little bit of a facelift that will go with the, the website update. This PowerPoint deck, for example, will get a, a, um, a modest refresh along with our website. Um, always continuing to coordinate and communicate with our partner agencies and organizations. And finally, um, we are in the process, I actually just talked with the firm today, to engage a survey and polling firm to conduct uh, community a community survey to collect data on what our community priorities are and how we best deliver services. So that'll be multifaceted, um, but one of the things and some of the questions we'll be asking is, how do you like getting your news? How do you get communications? What can we do better in that area? Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? That was terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, any questions from the council? I have to switch my screen here. I'm, I see Catherine has her hand up. I see Dan clapping Hi. his hands and Catherine <laughs> raising her hand. Hi, Shannon. Great work. Uh, I mean, the improvement in the last several years is so much more professional looking. I particularly like the follow-up um, email that has the council updates with the hyperlinks to them and then the city manager's report. I think those are spot on getting more information out there in targeted ways with so I really appreciate you moving that direction. I know Allison's been real instrumental in it too. Um, I have a few questions. First, just I beg of us when we do our new website design, we get better banner photos. Our banner photos uh, are just kind of, you know, they, they don't really show the majesty of what we have. So that's always been one of my pet peeves. Um, I went on Facebook today and I saw our site and there was a survey about um, how you use uh, or a survey about bike sharing programs um, that was on our face city of Larkspur Facebook page and you could link to a survey and fill out a survey. How, um, how often are we using those and, and how frequently do people um, uh, submit their, their content that way? Because I think that that's an opportunity. Do we know? So I, let me ask your question so I can answer it correctly. How often do we, so the, um, 
what council member way is referring to is for folks who didn't see a post that was just posted today in the past couple hours is the transportation authority of marin is um conducting a survey for folks who are interested in using or maybe interested in using bike share programs and there's um, they're particularly gauging interest in bike share um, stations, docking stations next to smart train stations to see what, where folks might be using them or where their destinations might be, et cetera, as well as other uses. Yeah. So in terms of um, partner agencies submitting us their initiatives or their, um, their projects where they like feedback, that happens on a weekly basis. Um, in term, are you asking a question about surveys specifically? I was just the first time I guess I saw that on our city's Facebook page was that link to fill out a survey um, from that. I mean, I, we filled out surveys from survey monkeys and other right. things. So, I just can I, I chime in for a second? Sure. Yeah. I, Sorry. I, I thought um, it was a great opportunity. So go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. So we've, as a philosophical matter, and this may be something the council wants to talk about, we've shied away from surveys that our voluntary participation, because most of the survey work that the city's chosen to do is to make high level policy and resource allocation decisions. And when you do a survey where you don't control the variables in terms of participation, so you have a scientific survey, yeah. uh, you, can't be cer you, you can't really say with any level of certainty whether that survey reflects public opinion. So we can do some of these surveys, but my recommendation is that uh, you don't want to do them if you're going to actually use those as the basis for spending money or making really targeted policy decisions because you're not going to necessarily know that you heard from the full breadth of the community. And that's why we like engaging companies that work to give us a confidence measure of what the survey results. Say. That, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Um, I just two more things. Do we have? Uh, do you ever capture hashtags on Twitter and Instagram if someone hashtags Larks for Marin or something, so that we can repost it? Yes. So uh, again, I don't want to get too technical, but we use uh, like a basically a social media posting and tracking program where we have a number of hashtags both just mar like Larkspur, hashtag Larkspur, always there. I hear a lot about Larkspur, Colorado. It's a lovely place, not as great as we are, but you know, so there's there's things that we're always, um, <laughs> that we're always certainly monitoring. So if someone hashtags, like I think one time it was the storms, it was the storms a few years ago, actually, where someone just hashtagged Larkspur and noticed that there was like a tree down and actually we would have found the tree eventually, but it was actually something where I was able to send it. <laughs> A public works ticket they weren't even asking us for anything they're just like huge storm um also there's a number of more we use our own hashtags so some of those pretty larkspur pictures we have love larkspur is one of our hashtags you notice it's also on our banners and then when our partner agencies we haven't run our own hashtag campaign yet um as things come back the community services department um library division recreation division have their own hashtags and then there have been a few regional hashtags when we've been working to get the word out on Great. stuff really Tam has come up with their own. To and my, my last comment is, um, I think I've noticed over the course of the year as the county's um, social media pages have become um, more consistent because of the COVID-19 information, they've also become bilingual. So as we continue in our efforts to find ways that we can reach all members of our community, and as we focus on equity and, and social justice issues, if we can slowly move into a bilingual platform where they might be parallel with each other so that you can see one in English only and then swipe left or swipe right, whatever way it is. Um, I just think it's something that would be um, a reflection on how we're embracing all members of the language languages spoken. So that's my only comments, thank you. Okay, Any, anything else from the council? Yeah, question from council member Paulson. Yeah, okay, Gabe, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Shannon, thank you, great. It was, um, I, I always love this uh, part of the updates. Um, I, I wanted to, you know, second Catherine's, um, you know, applause for the newsletter. I think it's really effective. Um, I think the graphics are great. You know, I realize you guys are, seems like you have an in-house, you know, hidden talent that you're using or something Not like hidden, that. But Andrew it, Bendixson. <laughs> You, so in yeah. terms of the banners, our, our city clerk was instrumental and it continues to be instrumental in a lot of the council updates, et cetera. But anything that 
is artistic is certainly not coming from me um, in terms of great design. <laughs> give credit where it's you're you're too modest thank you go ahead um, so so just a couple a couple questions and thoughts um one is on that email i'm curious as a metric do you track anonymous and and sort of registered users like you know is that newsletter going out to a distribution and i didn't see any place on the website to sign up so as point one maybe you can say a little bit about that and then point two um, you know, with the website design, uh, redesign, I, I realize you're on a limited budget, but I'm curious if there's any request for information or request for proposal on, on trying to expand, you know, the self-serve capabilities. Like there might be a lot more automation for, for building and permitting and whatnot, you know, where someone can really not just download a form, which they'd have to handwrite and then scan, but, you know, online forms. I, I think there's an awful lot of technology and as a council, it might just be good to see what the, the costs are because there might be a good return on investment. And, and maybe you've already gone down that path, but, but you know, as point two, maybe you can speak to that a little bit. And again, thank you. Yeah, so point one, I'll, I'll talk about the newsletter a little bit. So our newsletter, um, it is really popular. It has around, a, uh, it hovers between the low end is 30, the high end is 50 to 60% open rate. For nonprofit informational newsletters, you're happy to get 20 to 30% regularly, so we do have a really good amount of engagement. How we started our um, our newsletter list is before we completely moved to digital meeting, we had a number, we had a list of folks who we had emails and we basically, when we launched it, we sent out, um, this is the newsletter, this is our new ease new newsletter. This is what you can expect to hear from us. If you'd like to opt out, you can certainly opt out, et cetera. Um, from that, uh, Folks may remember back when we had in-person meetings, when we had a coyote meeting, or when we had one of our general plan update meetings, a lot of times we'd pass around a sign-in sheet that was optional. Folks weren't, you can always attend a meeting and just, just listen. But one of the check marks on there I had was, would you like to receive an e a newsletter from the, the community? So um, I have a lot of thanks to give Public Works when we were doing a number of our road repair meetings when they collected voluntary information and folks said they had an interest. Additionally, a lot of the growth we've seen this last year is we've slowly been migrating, not all at once, but again, introducing folks to our newsletter who are on our library list. Um, we wanted to see if they were interested in those communications. I'm sure, sure there are a number of folks who are very interested in library communications and story times who may be a little bit less interested in some of the other stuff and opt out, but we've really seen those, um, those opt-ins be retained, which is good for two reasons. It means that it, folks were doing things that are useful. And then also more on just the pragmatic side of it. If you opt too many folks in at once, um, there's certain, is it the Can Spam Act? I don't remember which act it is, but they basically don't want private companies getting a hold of email lists and sending folks stuff they don't want. So that's the newsletter side on it. In terms of the website redesign, the redesign will be with, um, it's in our website contract. We won't go out and ask for different firms for our website. We have a, a contract. It's it's in there, it will be essentially free of charge to get this makeover with our current provider. In terms of forms and improved forms, a lot of those changes you're talking about, I anticipate will actually happen as part of our land use software improvements. And in terms of things being a digital form versus having to fill everything out by paper, or maybe something that you can click and then um, go back to folks and that'll be the vehicle, actually not within the website and not built in through our website provider or through the software provider for our land use, which we already went through the RFP process and chose a vendor. Some simpler things that we've done and that are still in process for our forms is we're moving things to be, um, slowly but surely we're moving documents that are as appropriate to be e-signature. Um, so you can fill things in and it's, you know, you don't have to like write things down and then hope you have access to a scanner at home. Um, so we're already doing some of that for our, our, other, um, our other forms, if that answers your question. Great. There's one. There's one other digital initiative that we're in that's in process. Allison Fallis, your city clerk, is uh, working to uh, bring our database online for documents, which should uh, reduce the need for the public to submit records requests. They should be able to uh, obtain records online by themselves. Uh, one of the reasons we're a little behind other cities, you may be seeing some of these features at other cities, is that. Uh, we were using 
smaller packages for some of these different digital services in the past. So as Shannon was referencing, we're in the process of procuring a fairly substantial uh, community development department pack uh, land use management software package that will offer a lot of online services that we couldn't offer in the past. Um, and frankly, our network wasn't designed in a way that we felt comfortable operating a, a server with our documents where we were sure that confidential documents wouldn't potentially be exposed. So we've had to upgrade our network. And now that we've done that and upgraded our security, we're in a better position to offer that service and we hope to launch it shortly. Thank you. Yeah, terrific. Uh, any other comments or questions from the council? Thank you, Shannon. Great job. Really yeah, a, a, a trip, yeah, terrific. Um, it's uh, very exciting to hear everything you had to say to, this evening. And and um, Allison, the the mystery programmer. <laughs> Allison takes care of lots of things. I can guarantee that. So, should we open it up to the public? Are there any uh, public comments? I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members. Or any email public comment and there's no public comment okay Thank you. um so i'll bring it back to the council but i think we're uh, kind of finished with this item unless there's anything else and then we can move forward to uh, agenda item number four which is approval of the consent calendar uh, would any members of the council wish to remove an item from the consent calendar Uh, Gabe, Gabe, you're mute. You're muted. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I just thought that the the letter on SB nine is is worth explaining to the public a little bit. It seems you know pretty consequential to me, and we have a uh, you know a little bit of an audience today, so um, you know we have no no objections. I just thought uh, a little bit of discussion or clarification might be helpful. Um, well, that's fine. We can we can do that. Um, should we uh, pull that now and uh, have that conversation or can we just move since that you're not requesting it to be approved separately I, I assume correct correct would you like some comments Dan, 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 Dan if you if you could um, uh, address that briefly I'd appreciate it I'm actually going to invite Shannon back on the screen uh, who's the architect of our legislator uh, program so Hopefully she can pop back up here. All right, am I back? Yep, you are. Okay. Um, so just I'll give you a, a brief sketch of report. And again, if there's any questions, um, please feel free to ask any questions for members of the community who not know, who don't know. Um, the legislative session in California at the state level started again, resumed in early January. Last year there were Every year there's kind of a, an overarching legislative agenda of um, goals and things that were looked to be passed. Last year, a number of housing bills and a housing package was uh, at the forefront of um, a, a number of legislators and their priorities to pass. And then due to COVID-19, the legislative session had to understandably be changed significantly. So at the end of that session, there was a lot of legislation that folks who follow, particularly housing may have heard of and hardly anything passed out of either house. They were really focused on the budget, on COVID relief, et cetera. So we're at the very beginning now of the new legislative session. I know it's in March, but in terms of bills being printed, of bills being processed, of bills being amended, the bills that will be introduced this session have all been introduced. They haven't um, started meeting in committee. They haven't really started being amended in any formal way yet. Um, but it is emerging what are some bills that are um, a, of interest to the community, both in what we might be excited about and things that might concern us, as well as bills that it really looks like there's a lot of momentum behind that we might want to weigh in on sooner. Just to let everybody know, later in the legislative session, I plan on giving a more holistic overview of kind of all of the legislation that, per not all of the legislation, lots of the legislation that pertains to um, us as a city that we would be interested in. But really early in the session, the League of California Cities or Cal Cities as they're also, um, Kind of rebranded as asked member um, member municipalities, they identified SB9 as a bill where you really wanted to um, take a stance on it 
early in the session before they start meeting in committees, before there are amendments to the bill because there were some pretty serious concerns. For communities like ours, um, and actually municipalities throughout the area, you know, one of the things that is historically and is um, continues to be um, in the, um, sorry, in the purview of cities is land use. And this bill, the way it's written has really, really broad um, potential mandates for the state to require things of local governments. Um, particularly um, the way single family residential zones um, can be divided up. So as right now, it's it's essentially um, potentially requiring increased density in single family zones, uh, particularly the ability to split up lots so there is increased housing and to add um, accessory dwelling units and junior accessory dwelling units on one parcel without much input from the community or from the planning department or from the planning commission, council, et cetera. Um, chief among those concerns are, as it's written, it's very unclear if there will be any exemptions for high fire areas, very small lots, areas where there might be other concerns about parking or about um, traffic flow, et cetera. So this bill is essentially highlights a number of these things um, to say that the we oppose the bill as written unless it's amended to take some of these considerations. Um, into account. Okay, th thanks, Shannon. Uh, any any questions from the council? I see Catherine's raising her hand. I just want to say, as your as Larkspur's representative to the MCCMC Legislative Committee, that was a very good summary, Shannon. That was an exceptional summary, and I know you are the you are the staff person who who participates on that, and I have all my notes from our last meeting, but you gave an excellent summary and. Did you do that off the top of your head or did you have a little notes there? Because I was looking at my staff report, you notice my eyes on the Zoom screen. <laughs> no, because we did discuss this at that legislative committee meeting and um, you provided an excellent summary. So uh, I, I, I'll throw away my report because <laughs> uh, so thanks for we'll that. Likely, we'll likely um, be talking about this bill again. So yes. don't throw away any of your reports. To let folks know who are again listening from the community, etc. This letter, you know, legislators always like to hear from both constituents and different stakeholders. But it's likely that this will not be the end of the bill. There'll be many amendments, and we may be taking a, a modified stance as the session continues. And and I recall that all the cities were asked or were contemplating writing a letter. Is that? I think that's what Councilmember Frederick said. Within Marin. So them, right? uh, the, yeah. in the state, there's some, there's certainly some variation among councils and positions they they would take. But, um, and I have not checked the staff reports and where every um, what every council has decided to do. But I would, I would not be surprised if a majority or all Marin um, city, you know, municipalities have. And MCCMC for again for folks who don't follow acronyms or can't keep all of the acronyms straight, that's the Marin um, County Council of Mayors and Council Members, which is a regional group accomplishes a lot of things, but there's a legislative committee of representatives from each council um, in that group to take positions on legislation when it's um, when it has regional implications um, for the cities. So, so I, I, uh, it was very clear you were winging it tonight, Shannon. So <laughs> I think you, you did a good job on on that on that basis. Are there any other questions from uh, members of the council on this particular item? Because we we haven't uh, th th there wasn't a request to pull it from the consent calendar. Um, so that's mostly for information, I think. Um, I see Mr. Hilmer, please. Um, if there are no further uh, comments, I would move the consent calendar. Do we have a second? Second. second. Mr. Mayor, I, I think you had had a member of the public who had indicated oh, yes. wanted I'm, to I'm, speak I'm, on the consent calendar. I'm sorry. I, I, I skipped that. Yes, because we, we need to uh, invite them, the public to uh, ask for consideration of individual matters, maybe pull them for uh, separate consideration. So do we have that, Allison? Thank you. I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members or email public comment. Um, I know our prior raised hand I've spoken with offline. That was just an accidental raised hand. So there's no comments for the consent calendar right now from that uh, 
audience member. And okay. there is no other firmer, further public comment either. Okay. Then I guess we bring it back to the council, and I think we have a motion on the floor. And I think we have a second. Yeah. So do we need a roll call? Council Member Candell? Yes. Council Member Paulson? Yes. Council Member Way? Yes. Vice Mayor Homer? Yes. Mayor Haro? Yes. So the consent calendar is approved. And that moves us along to the next agenda item, which is the city manager's oral report. Thank you. Uh, I am going to do a quick share screen. So sorry, we're once again going to share screen, but I wanted to actually show you two things on websites um, today. So hopefully you're seeing the city's website. This is our homepage. Yeah, there it is. And you heard a reference actually to the first item I wanted to report on, which is that we've provided a link to a survey being conducted by uh, TAM, the Transportation Authority of Marin. Um, they are trying to collect feedback about uh, the electric bike sharing system that they've been working on that will be located at various smart stations. And we do encourage folks to participate and provide their feedback as uh, they'll be incorporating that into a number of uh, touch points to get feedback from the community. And actually to follow up on my earlier comment, the uh, council member way, I think when you do a survey as one of numerous ways that you're getting public feedback, then I think these more open-ended questions could be very useful and we'll have to give that some consideration uh, as we go forward. The other website I wanted to show you is uh, our Central Marine Fire Authority. Um, in case folks haven't had an opportunity to visit uh, the fire department, um, there is a prevention section, and I really want to encourage folks to visit the prevention section of the uh, website. There's a lot of useful information being posted there. And in particular, um, in case folks don't realize it, uh, the portion of the tax that funds the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority that goes to local agencies uh, comes to both Larkspur and Corte Madera. And one of the things we've done with that is we've hired a wildfire hazard mitigation specialist, Todd Landa, and he is uh, a wealth of information and a resource to the community. And he makes himself available by email to be contacted and he will uh, communicate with any property owner to, to answer questions about how you can make your um, property safer. Uh, one of the things that I want to highlight is we've added a new tab here. It just launched, I think, today. Um, but we've had a lot of folks asking about all the vegetation management that's going on around the community. And uh, we sent notices out, the fire authority did back in October, to inform people about the uh, upcoming work that the tax was going to fund. What we're now trying to do is we're, we're getting a lot of requests. Can you, can you give us a sense of where you're going to be? And it's a little tough for us to say on a given day where the work's going to be, but we have a pretty good sense where we're going to be generally in each month. So Todd's now going to be posting to this page which projects are, are happening in a particular month. So you can see he's posted the March projects here. So folks may be interested in finding out um, where the, they're going to be up, uh, you know, because some of this work, has, involves bringing in equipment and there is some noise, particularly when they're doing the large chipping work. And we know folks uh, <laughs> folks are hoping that the noise will come to an end one of these days. I do want to remind folks that the first year of this program is the intense year because we're removing years of uh, overgrowth and a lot of fire fuel. And we'll be coming back each year, but in future years, it, it should be more of a maintenance visit. It shouldn't be the sort of intense work you're observing happening in this particular year of the program. So those are the two things I wanted to share and I just thought I'd take advantage to show it visually uh, instead of just mentioning it this time. I turn it back to you, Mr. Mayor. Oh, thanks. That, that was very, very helpful because I, as, as, as you know, Dan, I've, I've been getting emails from people complaining about um, some of our very important work because it's noisy in managing um, the uh, uh, the fuel supply in our communities. So, um, 
We just need to keep it up. So let me get back to my screen. Are there any questions from the council for the city manager on his report? Uh, seeing none, we'll go to council members' oral reports. Do we have anything from our council members to report today? And I see Catherine's raising her hand. I do. There you go. I just want to fill in my colleagues on a few things that I've done in the last couple of weeks since we met. Um, that I think are gonna be important for us to pay attention to. So the first was what Shannon um, talked about, the MCCMC uh, legislative meeting committee met uh, a couple weeks ago and there were over 2,369 bills introduced in this session in Sacramento. That's um, all? Right, well, they'll, they'll flush them down, but 95, about 95 of them were housing bills. So we're about to um, get a lot of information about what's going to happen in, uh, in the state initiative of how well Shannon manages that information to that committee group. Um, I think the other thing that uh, was interesting was our representative um, Levine is uh, has a bill AB one four four five. Uh, that looks to take the arena numbers um, into consideration of emergency evacuation and other aspects of climate change. So those are some of the things we're going to look at. But I, um, I appreciate that that's an, a group that will be able to provide us with a lot of information. Um, second thing, I am our representative to the countywide priority setting committee. And we had a big meeting, the first one of the year. And just so people know what that is, is this is federal funding that comes to community development block grant program that provides communities with resources to address a wide range of unique community needs. Um, the focuses in Marin are on housing, on health and human services, children, youth and parent support services and basic health services, as well as housing for low income and moderate to low income persons. One thing that was interesting this year was that there was an open seat available for a representative of Corte Madera, Larkspur, Green Bray, Kent Field Corridor. And I encouraged um, a, a friend of mine to apply and she was appointed um, as the representative for uh, a two year term. She is a Larkspur resident and lives in the Canyon. Uh, Lonnie Mahanta, she is a labor and employment lawyer and most recently was the vice president of policy development and research for the Lyft Corporation. So she's um, gonna get actively involved in that and hopefully bring forward from Larkspur and our area um, ideas of how this federal funds can be spent. Um, we actually had at the first meeting uh, housing projects that bordered everywhere from Tamales to uh, the Rotary of San Rafael. Uh, to the Marin Housing Authority, San Geronimo Valley Affordable Housing, Bolinas Community Land Trust. It's a tremendous reach of grants that are available. Um, so the next two meetings will happen and then that decision is made by this group uh, and I represent us. Um, uh, this decision is made by this group then uh, to, to where these grants will be allocated and then that is brought forward to the Board of Supervisors. So I'll keep you updated on that and I'm just really pleased that we have another Larkspur participant and I hope to bring um, Lonnie into many other things within the city because she's sharp and very be very helpful for us. And lastly, I attended the monthly age friendly monthly meeting. They invited me as a guest to keep learning more about what age friendly means. Um, and they meet monthly uh, on Zoom from all of the age-friendly uh, communities within Marin County. They had a couple of speakers to talk about um, where age-friendly is working in San Mateo and other places. So that's my report. Thank you, Catherine. Anyone else on the council? Uh, Dan Helmer, did you want to say anything about the conversations we've been we've recently had about the uh, 580 interchange, or is that we're not quite there yet? Uh, a little, a little early. Uh, I'll, I I will just report that we had a discussion between the city and the staff of the Transportation Authority in Marin regarding the 101 580 connector, um, and I am talking to the executive director uh, also tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. 
there's an, also a meeting Friday of an ad hoc committee to talk about um, the various alternatives that are in play. And, and that that and good enough. I just, I appreciate the opportunity to to uh, join Vice Mayor Hilmer in those conversations, and to make sure that the interests of Larkspur are taken into account as that those discussions go forward. I'll I'll just add that I'll I'll make sure that uh, anything worth reporting to the council will be something that the Transportation Authority of Marin Board itself takes up at their meetings. Mr. Mayor. If, yes. I could just, if I could just interject, I'm not sure everyone in the public who's listening may be familiar with what you're talking about, so it might be valuable to provide some context. The Transportation Authority of Marin has been conducting a study to see if there is a way to improve connections between Highway 101 and Interstate 580, and they've been analyzing a variety of different alignments and alternatives, and so what Mayor Haroff has been referencing is that uh, Vice Mayor Hilmer as your TAM representative and Mayor Harf as the alternate were invited to a meeting to hear the latest alternatives that are being analyzed um, and provide some general feedback. I think that uh, people should know it's just in a study phase. There's not a project actually uh, imminent. So. Right. And I, I appreciate that that clarification. I just wanted to make sure that people were aware that these conversations are, are going forward and that um, uh, our Larkspur representatives are fully engaged in, in those discussions. Um, uh, anyone else from the council? Um, I'm seeing heads shaking. So um, I'll just mention one thing. Um, uh, as folks know, I have continued to participate in conversations with representatives of uh, uh, both the county and other municipalities in the Ross Valley about the Ross Valley, or I'm sorry, about the Sir Francis Drake uh, uh, naming project, if you want to call it that. I'm not sure that's, uh, that's really a relevant way of describing it at this point. Um, but we had a, we've had a series of very good conversations, including one just on on Saturday, which involved uh, a lot of different people uh, expressing their views on, on this topic. Um, and I think there may be a, um, a way of uh, addressing concerns over the naming issue that will be uh, satisfactory to a, a wide swath of our community. Um, it's that's still it's still kind of preliminary, but the county will be having a meeting on March 9th, I believe, where they will be considering it. And one of the proposals is not to adopt a formal renaming of the roadway, um, but to uh, allow the installation of uh, essentially historical signage um, throughout the course of Sir Francis Drake from our jurisdiction all the way out in, in to West Marin. And there's some design concepts that have been floated um, to accomplish that, which are actually quite attractive. So um, I think at this point um, where things are is the <laughs> Board of Supervisors will be discussing the issue. And I think we'll um, probably provide um, a decision that will uh, be helpful to us in our own uh, our own involvement on that on that issue, but it's been a really very rewarding opportunity for me to engage in such a diverse uh, element of our community uh, in a conversation that some view as purely symbolic, but I view as something more than that, and I'm very glad that um, we're making progress on that. So, uh, stay tuned. Uh, and unless there's anybody else on the council that wants to make a report. Um, I don't know that we uh, we need to have a request for public comment, but certainly would invite that. I'm looking for any ways to hands from our audience members or any emailed public comment. And there's no public comment. Okay. So I think we're finished with agenda item number six and agenda item number seven, public hearings. There are none which moves us directly to agenda item uh, eight, 
uh, which is essentially an update on city activities and finances about uh, COVID-19. So I'll turn that over to uh, our city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be very brief. We covered finances fairly extensively at your strategic planning retreat last Friday. Um, <laughs> the main thing I wanted to share with you today is there's a countywide discussion evolving as we look at what exactly is a parklet and our parklets here to stay. Um, you know, if you go in downtown Larkspur, uh, we authorized three restaurants to be out in the parking spaces. So um, that's kind of what most people think of when they say parklet. But and you'll note that one restaurant chose to build a structure and the other two have simply put tables and, and heaters out in the in the parking. We have authorized some other uh, businesses to be out on the sidewalk. And so uh, that's been Larkspur's extent. Some of the other communities in Marin have authorized a number of other arrangements and a large number of parklets. And so uh, most of us did it under the emergency powers that the councils granted to the city managers. And we did it on rolling basis for three, six months, even a year for some of the more significant investment. Um, so now the question is, as these, these permits are starting to approach their expiration dates, uh, what's next? Are we uh, doing this again on a temporary basis? Are we starting to look at this as a permanent thing? And what's the process for asking those questions of uh, both you and the public? And so uh, those conversations are taking place now and I expect to be able to report more in coming uh, meetings. Okay, great. Um, any any uh, uh, questions for the city manager on that? Anything from the public? Looking for any raised hands from our audience members or any email public comment. And there is no public comment. Okay, well, good enough. So that uh, brings us to our last um, agenda item, which is adjournment. Item number nine, do I have a motion? So move. Second. I've Sec <laughs> got multiple seconds here. Uh, by consent, we are adjourned. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone.